Okay, so I will, I will tell you about what happens on the molecular level to the, it's basically a complement to the talk that Peer uh, started with today because he's the medical doctor and he looks at the patients and the symptoms and I look at the molecules and try to understand what goes wrong with the molecules. So I will tell you briefly about proteins, the best and most interesting molecules in the universe, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, what are amyloid fibrils, a specific form of proteins? How does such an amyloid fibril form? And how we could possibly stop them from forming. So what are proteins? You can think about proteins like a pearl chain, uh, but instead of having just always the same pearl, you have 20 different pearls, right? And so you can make them as long as you want, and in every position can be one of 20 different amino acids, as we say. And this is a very, very small protein here, 22 amino acids. But if you wanted to make all possible combinations of 22 amino acids, there would be more of them than water molecules in three tons of water, so an unbelievably large number. And if you make the protein even bigger, you can have more possible combinations than there are atoms in the universe. So we couldn't even build a single copy of every single protein that we can dream, dream out. So the most complicated molecules in the universe, and I, I think also the most fascinating molecules. So what do proteins actually do for us? And the answer is everything. So right, everything that uh, happens in our bodies at any one time is really controlled by proteins. There's thousands of different proteins that work like little machines all at the same time. And an example would be hemoglobin, which transports our oxygen through our body, or an antibody, which is, of course, what fights disease, such as the coronavirus and so on. And, you know, for the Danes here, I guess there is a few. Uh, Christian Bohr, Niels Bohr's father, was, of course, uh, making groundbreaking research on hemoglobin already uh, 100 years or so ago. So proteins normally have to fold. So they start off as this disordered coil or chain, right? And they usually have to fold, adopt a very well-defined three-dimensional structure. And it's actually one of the miracles in the universe that this even works because every protein has to find its right structure. And if it was really just trying by chance, finding the right structure, it would take longer than the lifetime of the universe to actually find its structure because there's so many, unbelievably many combinations. But in reality, from here to here takes less than a millisecond. So it's a magical process whereby the protein knows exactly what it should do. And of course, evolution has optimized protein structures to make them find the right structure. But sometimes this goes wrong. Sometimes this structure is not found. And then a long range of diseases can follow, and actually many that you know and many that you don't know. You know, cataracts in the eye is a protein aggregation and misfolding disease. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, some forms of cancer are, are caused by proteins misfolding. Sickle cell anemia is a disease where the blood cells misbehave and you, you, you get anemia. Cystic fibrosis and many others. So the ones I want to talk about more and I'm interested in is these here, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So in these diseases, and I guess uh, Per Borhammer uh, introduced it really well, we find strange clumps and aggregates of proteins in the brain. This would in this case be a brain of an Alzheimer patient. And if you stain them, you find interesting structures that a healthy person does not have. And if you look with the best microscopes in the world, you see that these are these long, thin, aggregates, clumps of proteins, and they, each of these things contains many thousands of protein molecules, one after the other, attached in a highly ordered way. And this is a sort of cutting edge uh, atomic resolution structure of such a fibril, uh, one of the first of a brain derived fibril that was ever solved by one of my old friends from Cambridge five years ago, six years ago. And Basically, um, this is almost like a crystal. It's so ordered. It's, when you think about aggregates, you might think of some disordered random clump, but actually this is almost like a crystal. So thousands and thousands of molecules, one after the other, highly ordered. So how does this thing form? That, that's really what I'm interested in. And you can easily imagine that if you have thousands of molecules together, they don't all find each other at the same time. It's a stepwise process. And so what you need is something that we would call nucleation. So the first few molecules of protein come together and form a little fibril, a little aggregate. And then this aggregate can grow and become longer and longer and longer because new proteins can attach to the ends. And then it, because it's a very long and thin structure, it can break. 
and all of a sudden you have one, it breaks, you have two. Imagine you have one, it grows, it breaks, you have two, they grow and break, you have four, you have eight, you have 16, you get an exponential increase like a virus. It can replicate, okay? So what we are trying to do is understand how they can multiply and how to stop this multiplication. And so one thing we noticed really early is that surfaces play a very, very big role, specifically for the proteins involved in Parkinson's disease. So they bind to the cell surface, to the lipid bilayer. And why does that introduce the aggregation in some cases? So this is a bit of a complicated illustration, but it's supposed to show, imagine you have these proteins swimming around. They rarely find each other. They rarely meet each other. So it's not easy for them to aggregate. But once they are bound to a two-dimensional surface, it's much easier for them to find each other. They run into each other more often. It's like, you know, there's, there's more crashes between cars than between planes, because planes are in three-dimensional space, and cars are just confined, actually, to a one-dimensional track, you could say. It's much easier to, to collide. And then there are some other reasons. It's actually a bit unstable to make a new clump of proteins, and if it can bind to a surface, it's a bit more energetically stable, so it's actually easier to form. And then if you look at the internal structure of the protein, it can be a bit distorted and bent in all sorts of ways when it absorbs to a surface. So the bottom line is, when proteins bind to surfaces, they become more uh, aggregation prone. So this is something we found out, and we also were wondering whether what we illustrated here, that basically proteins can bind to the fibril itself, and then a new fibril can form, and then that can go away, and then you have two all of a sudden. This was postulated to exist, and there was some evidence that this might exist, and we went to look for it, because that would, of course, have a dramatic effect. Again, if you have one fibril only, all of a sudden you have two, then you have four, then you have eight, and the system just gets completely out of control. And so uh, I guess this is probably the most impactful uh, experiment I have done in, in my uh, career, even though it doesn't look like much. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, sometimes, initially, it doesn't look like much, but actually the interpretation, it's all. So what I did here simply is I let these proteins aggregate at different pH values. And so what you can see, I, I added tiny amounts of the fibrils into the solution, and then I added, let the system just aggregate. And I found that at, at a neutral pH, close to neutral pH, it was very slowly aggregating, and the only thing that happened was that the mon like proteins added to the fibrils and they were running longer. But all of a sudden, upon a certain pH decrease, which these are all still pH values you find somewhere in the brain in some parts of the cell, you can see an acceleration. So the, if this is the, the y-axis is the amount of fibrils and the x-axis is the time, you can see that it gets faster, it accelerates. And the only way it can accelerate is if you make more aggregates than you had initially. So what we discovered was basically that under some conditions, these fibrils could make more of themselves. So they could really amplify. And we believe that this is possibly the molecular basis of what Peer told you, which is that the aggregation, the misfolding of the protein starts, he believes in the, in the gut, and is of course groundbreaking results. In fact, now I finally know, who, you know, I knew his publications. I know his face now. It's, it's really, really great. So he, he found that probably these aggregates come into the brain from the gut and go through the vagus nerve. But the question is, why do we have them initially just a few of them in the gut? And at later stages, we have many of them all over the brain. So there must be some process that makes more aggregates. Maybe the first ones start by some accident or you eat something bad. We don't know. But all of us, like after many years later, they are all everywhere. So we believe that the process that amplifies them is the key process that we should tackle in order to stop the disease from uh, progressing. And so I would like on my last two, three slides, show you one set of results that we had, which uh, this is not likely to be, become a drug, but we've discovered a new principle of how to stop this process. So what you see here in gray, is an artificial protein that a colleague of mine has designed, which is supposed to bind to this alpha-synuclein protein, which is the one in Parkinson's disease that forms these clumps. Okay? So the one in color is this alpha-synuclein protein. It's actually a very disordered protein on its own, and once it starts aggregating, it forms these beautifully ordered fibrils. But when it binds to this artificial gray protein, this protein forces it to, it clamps it into a certain structure. And we found that in this state, the protein can no longer aggregate. It's basically a harmless protein. And what we found was very interesting, which was that if we just looked at how the fibrils grow, 
you needed to add stoichiometric amounts of this inhibitor, which means that for every molecule of the bad protein you want to stop, you need one molecule of the good protein to bind to it. So it's not a very efficient way. You need a lot of this drug, if you like to call it like that. But what we then found was that the, the key process whereby a new aggregate forms on the surface of an existing one, which is really what makes the thing go out of control, that one was very easy to stop at very low concentration. So if we added 100 times less than in this experiment, we still found almost complete suppression. So you needed to add a tiny amount of this inhibitor protein to get almost complete suppression of this specific process. You see that the, the, the aggregates form very quickly with very small concentrations or nothing of the inhibitor, but you can really, if you add one to one, it's completely stopped. And if you add one in 10, you see that it's much, much slower. So this is a very efficient way of stopping the aggregation. And you know, something along those lines will probably ultimately be, become a drug, I would suggest. So the conclusions would be, and this is really something I want to hit home because my, my great mentor, uh, Chris Dobson, whom I pay tribute on the, on the last slide, that was he, really his message. Because for a long time, people said, you know, at old age, you might get forgetful, you might have some ailments. This is normal. But actually, most of these things are not just normal aging. They're actually diseases, and we can treat them. I think we, as human society, we can be very optimistic. We have done amazing things. We can be very optimistic that even those problems, we can treat them ultimately. And you know, this is difficult, as Pea pointed out, 50 tries, no success. I would say this is more complicated than, you know, the Manhattan Project and the Apollo Project combined. I mean, this is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that humankind has faced, but I think we can actually ultimately do this. So despite many failed attempts, we still believe for many reasons that protein aggregation is the best target to attack. And, you know, my particular take on this is that the detailed understanding of the aggregation mechanism is a requirement for making progress in this area. And so, yeah, I'd like to thank my fantastic research group at DTU and uh, Sir Chris Dobson, who sadly passed away a few years ago, who was really extremely influential in my scientific career, an absolute inspiration. And then I have to say, I've only been in Denmark for four years, but basically almost all the foundations have already decided to, to grant me some money. And I have to say, I'm extremely grateful. It's been an extremely generous experience, uh, you know, since, since I joined. And uh, of course, the latest has been the Elite Force piece, for which I'm very thankful. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>